without further ado, I would like to pass over to the chair of this session. Squadron Energy came on early as a sponsor, and we are so grateful because we may not have made the decision to proceed with the Congress without their support. It's been absolutely super that they've um, stuck with us. Uh, and we would love to think that the relationships between big renewables and community energy is just going to go grow stronger and stronger from this point onwards. Kath, please um, welcome Kath Elliott from Squadron Energy. Um, thanks very much, Heather, for that. Um, Squadron Energy was really excited to be involved in this Congress. We understand that in order to achieve our goals in this country, we need to make sure that we're working very closely and with, in, with knitted relationships with all stakeholders and particularly those like you who have got a, um, as much of an interest and enthusiasm about renewable energy as we do. So it's fantastic to be here and great also to be here and to listen to some wonderful speakers this morning. Um, excuse me a moment, I've just left my notes. Um, this morning we've got, uh, as, as uh, Heather said, Sabine is unwell, so we send our warm regards to Sabine if she's online or, uh, at all. But I'd like to introduce our two speakers this morning, uh, Kim Malley, who is the Director of the Community Power Agency. Um, and Kim is, wrote the original Benefit Sharing Guide. She'll provide an overview around the best practices that they've seen are working um, on community engagement for renewable energy zones and major projects. So we're looking forward to hearing from you, Kim. And also Andrew Bray, who's probably known to, you probably know, all know Kim really well too, but um, Andrew seems to be everywhere all the time. I <laughs> come, come across him everywhere I go, which is great. Um, Andrew's going to, he advocates for renewable energy uh, through the lens of regional renewal. And um, of course, he, he heads up Realliance, which is a great organisation. And we've had a, we have a lot to do with Realliance and really supportive of their work and looking forward to hearing about the latest work that, um, that Andrew and Realliance are doing today. So I'd like you to um, give a round of applause for both of them in anticipation of their great, their great talk. Um, Kim is going to start first, so I'd like to welcome Kim up. Thank you. Thanks, Kath. So my name's Kim, as, as we've just learned, and I am from Community Power Agency, but I will just clarify that Community Power Agency wrote one of the original guides on benefit sharing, not personally myself, although I have had um, the great pleasure of working on a number of benefit sharing and community engagement uh, guidelines over the last couple of years. So while we're getting settled, I'll do the little bit of the intro about we, you know, who we are and where we've come from. Hands up if you've come to one of the other Community Energy Congresses over the years, a few. I attended the first one in um, 2017 before I was with, um, sorry, second one in 2017, thank you, um, before I was with uh, Community Power Agency and I was hooked. I came from local government and I could see here is a movement of people doing some impactful work that is changing the landscape of, um, of Australia's energy system. And um, I put CPA firmly in my sights and over the years um, I, I found my way to being working with them in 2020 and CPA has come from this foundation of wanting to enable community energy um, from research and working with grassroots organisations, many of you in the room, um, through to working hand in hand with um, large scale industry and um, industry bodies like the Clean Energy Council to show them what great community engagement can look like, what great benefit sharing can look like. Um, in the last few years, we've started to also get to write guidelines for state governments and work on res policies and the res rollout. And from our vantage point, with one foot in community, one foot working with industry and one foot in government, we've been able to get some really great crossovers of what needs to shift and change. So what I'm going to um, go through today is all around the intersection of community benefit sharing with large-scale renewables, which has been highly developed through the wind industry over the last 10 to 15 years in Australia. Solar industry is getting much more sophisticated with it. The intersection of the benefit sharing concept and where community energy fits in. So to understand benefit sharing, we might start with the definition, which is something that um, CPA co-defined in one of the original industry guides that we wrote. 
So community benefit sharing involves sharing the rewards of renewable energy development with the local community. And it aims to integrate that development in the local community. It's not an us and them, it's an us and us. <laughs> and it's about the future vitality and the success of that region with the development being a good neighbour, just like any other neighbour or corporate entity in that area. And it's about creating trust and long-term relationships. So for it to be done well, benefit sharing must have ha planned strategies. It's not just coming up with a great idea to splash some cash around town. Um, the project has to be valued by the community and the way it's valued is by having great community engagement that enables communities to participate in the decision making process. Fundamental part of community energy and there's some really wonderful um, crossovers because of that. Benefit sharing is a really important tool for rural and regional areas experiencing large scale development for their ability to un understand what's going on inside a project and for their willingness to accept change to their landscape because they have had agency and a say over what they're going to get out of it and how that development will look. It's also a really fundamental concept. It speaks to what Heather was talking about with the sun and wind. Sun, wind and water are a common wealth resource, not a common wealth resource, a common wealth resource. And there is a fundamental principle that these resources and the monetizing of these resources should be shared with the communities that host them and take care of them. So let's have a look at what <coughs> some of these benefit sharing initiatives might look like, typically in large scale um, wind and solar businesses. Firstly, the ones that most people probably turn their mind to are community grant funds, and, and this is, is very typical, very established in the industry. And that might be for things such as solar on the local preschool or a new stove at the Meals and Wheels kitchen. It might be um, upgrading the air conditioning and energy efficiency fit-outs for the seniors' hall. It might also be grants for biodiversity regeneration. Next, we have neighbourhood benefit sharing programs. In years gone past, the only payments, direct payments, that were made in an area for hosting large-scale renewables were the, to the hosts, which would mean you might have a neighbour immediately next door to a wind turbine uh, not getting anything and tens of thousands of dollars going to the one that has the turbine on their property. So benefit sharing over the years has got more sophisticated and really <coughs> acknowledged that it's a whole neighbourhood that hosts um, the infrastructure and so that those benefits should be shared um, across neighbour property boundaries as well. Um, employee volunteerism. This is one I really want to highlight for the community energy sector. This is an exciting opportunity where large scale uh, developments come to an area, the ability to be able to access in kind technical expertise engineering, financial, legal advice for some of the more sophisticated community energy projects that you might like to do. Neighbourhood batteries, microgrids, solar gardens, mid-scale solar. These are inherently complex community energy projects that are expensive to get past the pre-feasibility and feasibility stages. So where there's opportunities to partner with existing teams that are wanting to build large scale, that's a wonderful synergy. Benefit sharing also includes the cost to setting up co-investment and co-ownership models for the community to be able to purchase shares or even um, have ownership stakes in a project. Legacy, legacy initiatives can come from benefit sharing with large scale corporates, which could be um, really understanding what's important to a community. So for example, we've seen some benefit sharing initiatives where a corporate developer has paid, committed to 10 years to fund a suicide prevention officer at the local neighbourhood centre, because that's what is really, really important to that community. And then also looking at um, innovative products. So for example, um, looking at, at reduced costs of electricity surrounding developments or even solar gardens, which I'll, I'll touch on a bit later. So here's an example, Wool North in northern Tasmania. Um, they partnered with the Royal Flying Doctors Service and funded $350,000 to fit out um, a mobile dental care unit because in northwest Tasmania it's a long way to a dentist. And so uh, this dental truck provides free dental care to the aged care facilities and schools in northern Tasmania and it's a wonderful example of the community needs um, partnering with a large-scale uh, wind, wind farm developer, um, operator I should say, 
and being able to provide that. Canula Bridge is our um, wind farm that uh, has six turbines and 20, tw at 29 megawatts, and it's a wonderful example of great community engagement. They really um, focused in on having deliberative conversations, transparent conversations with the community, and as a result, they were able to develop benefit sharing programs and, and, and alter the design of their project in line with what the community wanted to be able to come up with some really excellent outcomes. They had unanimous approval at local council, minimal objections, a five-month approval process, which is very cost-effective for a wind farm, no negative press, lots of letters of support, and they were successful in the ACT tender. And this really goes to show that when community engagement is invested well with the community and they are brought along genuinely, for example, at Canula Bridge, the uh, community reference board has one member that sits as a silent observer inside the board of Canoa Bridge Wind Farm. So there is no barrier between um, the community and what's happening um, for that developer. So some of you, uh, hands up if you've heard of Haystack Solar Garden. Yes, <laughs> talking to the converted. We've been working on this for five years and um, if you've heard of it, you know it's Australia's first um, large-scale solar garden. It's just finished construction. We're moving into the commissioning stage uh, now with Essential Energy. And whilst Haystack Solar Garden is not a benefit sharing program um, or initiative from a large-scale renewable project, as it is a 1.5 megawatt community solar farm, what solar gardens represent is a really exciting opportunity to provide debt financing to a corner of um, that's my time, um, a corner of the, you know, a larger scale entity that can then uh, offer those benefits in solar plots, either back to metropolitan areas or to disadvantaged areas in rural. And so there's some exciting things to explore with that. We're running a webinar on knowledge sharing of haystacks on the 28th of March. Um, and if you want to sign up to CPA's newsletter to come along to that, we'll, we'll go into the business model. All right, so I'm at time. And these are some of the examples that community energy can look to explore with large-scale renewable energy developers. And there are examples of these happening throughout Australia and internationally. Um, simple infrastructure, small infrastructure on community assets, PV and um, solar hot water. You could look at revolving energy funds. I mentioned solar gardens, help with running bulk buys. Um, you could look at having help for doing a mid-scale solar uh, farm in an area where you've got a large-scale solar farm so that you can leverage off their expertise and maybe some grid studies. Neighbourhood batteries, we've seen community electric bucks, buses and solar lights and EV charge stations being put in in collaboration with large-scale and obviously the co-investment and co-ownership models. The last thing I want to end on is a little bit of a warning, an understanding of the nuance of what community benefit sharing means for large-scale developers. Large scale, uh, large scale projects like wind and solar, they need an avenue to be able to connect with their local neighbourhood that hosts them. So if you are a community energy group and you're like, fantastic, actually there's this solar farm coming to town, we're going to do EVs and we're going to do a neighbourhood battery and all of these wonderful regional um, initiatives, it cannot be at a cost of the benefit sharing that happens at the neighbourhood and the immediate geogra ge geographic area around those. It has to be in addition to, because if we compete against those sites, it sets up conflict and an avenue for um, division within our communities. So it's a layered approach and we need to be really mindful that both need to happen. Thanks. Thanks, Kim. That was great and very pacey, I have to say. So I imagine there'll be a lot of questions later to try and uh, tease out some more detail around some of the things that you've been saying. But fantastic. Thank you very much. I'd like to invite um, Andrew to come up now. Andrew Bray heads up Realliance, as I said earlier, uh, to talk to us. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Kath. Um, and thank you, uh, thank you, Kim. It's great to be able to come up after... Kim, because like CPA like wrote the book about benefit sharing, so I don't have to do any of that now because she's just laid it out in chapter and verse. Um, so, 
benefit sharing and co-ownership. So, um, so that means I get the, the opportunity to, to really um, perhaps look a little bit more at the social context. And um, in fact, I'll try to be kind of brief so that we can have lots of, um, lots of question time. So, um, but I will, I will run through a couple of things. Um, I've got some involvement with the Goulburn Community Solar Farm that you heard about yesterday. Um, from Jonathan, um, I'll talk about that and uh, a couple of other things. Um, so firstly, um, so RE Alliance, we are um, a not-for-profit independent um, our advocacy group. Uh, we work in the energy transition and really about the role of regional communities and trying to equip regional communities to, um, to, be, to really play a part in the, in the energy transition. Uh, like CPA, we also have three feet. We have one foot in the community, one in, um, in industry and one in government. So um, that's, I hadn't realised that particular peculiarity of, of our two organisations, but we work in a very similar kind of way like that. Um, oops, uh, we have, we've uh, got a slightly growing team, um, but as you can see, it's sort of quite dispersed um, up and down the eastern seaboard um, and we, we try to have people in, um, in the regional areas where the renewables are, are built. So far north Queensland, central west Irana, Res in New South Wales, western Victoria uh, and Tasmania as well. Uh, so just on so-called big renewables, um, I just thought, just sitting in on some of the sessions yesterday, it might be worth quickly reflecting on, on the role of big renewables and little renewables, let's say, you know, um, and, and so I just went back to the integrated system plan to look at, well, what, what's the sort of projections around the role that each of those will play? Uh, and, uh, and in the... Uh, after 2050, um, in the latest um, ISP, they, they've um, uh, projected 126 gigawatts of, of new um, wind and solar, large-scale wind and solar. Um, with around 10,000 kilometres of new transmission. This is out to 2050, so it's 25 years, um, with an, another 74 uh, gigawatts of storage. So they're, they're quite big numbers. On the, on the CER or sort of small-scale solar side, it's, it's about 76 uh, gigawatts. They might have it wrong. It's a projection. You know, it could be 126, small, you know, CER and small-scale. It could be 75 uh, gigawatts of large scale, but nevertheless, the two the two sort of need to coexist in that way, and and, and b doing all the great work that happens, you know, in in smaller centres in urban urban situations to, to get community energy, it's a it's um, it's very important, but it'll always have to sit alongside the the large scale stuff. Um, but perhaps perhaps what's different is is that social context. So. It, as, as Kim was rightly describing, um, large-scale developers need a way to connect with their community and to be able to... Like, they obviously need to be, um, you know, reassuring people that the impacts will be managed and that they'll, they'll be managed in a way that people are... Um, is acceptable for the local community, but that discussion around benefits is a really good place to start. What can we actually do for your community uh, that's, that's going to make you feel that this is a worthwhile addition to your community, this project. Um, so I want to talk quickly about the, um, the example of Sapphire Wind Farm. So this is perhaps something Catherine could speak to us uh, as well because it is a squadron project. But it was originally um, developed in the, um, in the New England area by CWP Renewables, which has gone on to become squadron. Uh, and... And as part of that um, part of that project, they actually won uh, a an auction with the ACT scheme. Uh, the ACT had a renewable energy auction scheme in about 2015 or thereabouts, which was a critical part of actually keeping the transition moving while um, the Abbott government was was laying a hatchet to the the federal renewable energy target. Um, so it was very important. But this particular project won one of those auctions. And a really critical part of that auction process was that it gave weighting to community programs and outcomes. So it sort of meant that uh, Sapphire was able to, to get a leg up and win that auction because they brought a number of really innovative 
and community-centred approaches to what they were doing. And one of these was, um, was a proposal to set up a community co-investment sort of chunk, if you like, of the project. Um, and this hadn't really been done before in this way, and so essentially what, what ended up happening was that they um, brought out a certain amount of the sort of project finance, made it available to the local community, uh, and the community were able to buy into that and have a share. And so um, I think a bit over $1 million of the project is actually owned by community. Um, and so uh, I was sort of slightly involved with those... Um, uh, with that whole process. And I, I think this is the important thing about this, is that uh, CWP at the time put a huge amount of effort into making this a community, a genuinely owned by the community process. So they went out, um, I've just listed there just one of the sort of flyers we had at the time of all the different sessions that they had with community in, in all the different places around the New England there. So it was a, so it was a huge roadshow. They brought out um, a, a Swedish guy who could talk about community energy as it was... Oh, sorry, Danish, um, uh, on his island in Denmark. And um, so they really, they really went all out. They engaged with people, said, well, what, what do you want to do? What are the barriers for you to be able to invest? You know, what sort of sums? What kind of returns would you need? Uh, and, on, and out of that, they developed the whole process. Um, so that was a really... Um, that was a really exciting process, actually. But having said that, um, it's not something that I, I think has been replicated since. Um, uh, who knows? It may be again in the future. But, um, but nevertheless, it was a way that, that people were able to engage directly as a community with the process. Um, I'll quickly talk about the, the Goldman Community Solar. Jonathan Prendergast mentioned it. He's actually the guy doing the work on this stuff. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I'm, I'm the chair of the, the community board on this one. Uh, it really relies on a couple of guys who are sort of activated through one of the, um, the one of these congress events, um, I don't know, six years ago or something, and they've pretty much been volunteering, um, uh, you know, in a very dedicated way since then, and that's what's kept the, the project going. So it is, it's um, where... Uh, I don't think we've got the vital statistics here, have we? No, we don't. Um, but it, it's a 1.4 megawatt um, uh, solar uh, uh, solar project, which will be next to the railway line in Goulburn. Uh, it's, it'll have a battery uh, that'll go with it, which I think is 2,300 kilowatt hours from memory, but Jonathan will know the answer to that. Um, but 300 Goulburn residents have been able to... We are a co-op, and so we we will own the project um, outright, which is pretty exciting. Um, we raised $2.6 million of uh, funds, member funds, and we have a um, $2.3 million grant from the New South Wales government to make it happen as well. So, um, so that's a very exciting thing to be part of. Um, uh, and there's a, a wonderful quote from our uh, one of our members, Jimmy D. Taylor, who's also a member of my... Realliance Board. She's a lovely person. Um, how does it work? Investors can buy into the project for a flexible amount, uh, purchasing one solar panel, ostensibly, for $400. Um, I am one of those $400 members, can I say? Um, so every, everybody is welcome. Uh, all the energy produced is sold into the grid, so we'll, uh, we'll be essentially just doing that through an agent, selling it to, um, into the distribution grid uh, and getting the, the price at the time. Uh, investors are estimated to receive a return on investment about 5% a year. Um, so we're getting deeper into those figures at the moment. Um, and it operates as a cooperative. Uh, the final thing I want to touch on is the role of local leadership or regional um, leadership. And so we've been involved in a process with the Hayshire Council, uh, which is uh, in sort of far southwest. New South Wales, they have a renewable energy zone coming to that area. Uh, and they are very unusual, I'd say, in, among councils in that they're looking ahead to the res and saying, all these projects are coming here. We want to be on the front foot and say what we want out of, the, out of these projects. So these are the... So we, we worked with them to do a community um, engagement process where they got a sense of the, the things that were important to people, you know, 
accommodation and housing. The future, like agriculture, is sort of employing less and less people over over time there because the farms are becoming larger. So, how do you keep enough people in the region to make it sort of viable? How can you create new industries? So, all those things were there. They've put together a. For, uh, principles for successful renewable energy development in Hay, and and we've had a round table with industry there, proponents, um, and so they are now leading that process. The council are now leading that process where they're going to the the large developers and saying, okay, this is what we want. How will you deliver? And then, and it's a process of collaboration here across the developers. So that's a quite interesting part. Um, Sabine, who was going to be talking here. Um, did ask me to also mention a process that they're working on in Wimmera, Southern Mallee, um, which is, is a similar one in that the local development association has um, brought all the, the renewable energy developers in the region together to, uh, to essentially work on a similar process to this. Uh, and we had our first, uh, first workshop for that in Dimboola just a few weeks ago. Dimboola's a lovely place. Who's been to Dimboola? Got a great, it's got a great river and like swimming opportunities and all sorts of things. It was stinking hot and it was a good time for it. Um, so look, that's all I want to say um, and I look forward to your questions. Thanks, Andrew. I think we're all going to sit up here now and take questions, but that was, that was great. Thanks very much for mentioning the Sapphire Project. And uh, I'd just like to point out that that project has been a real, uh, really good one for us at Squadron Energy. Um, the, the barrier to entry is very low, so you, know, you can purchase in, um, for $1,000. We, we're certainly looking at that model and deciding whether or not we want to move forward with that. And I can't really say too much about that at the moment, but um, keep an eye out because when, if we do decide to move forward with anything similar, then we'll be certainly announcing it in the, in the media. Now that we're all perched up here, uh, we have got a couple of questions, but I just thought I'd take the opportunity to indulge myself, if you don't mind, and ask a couple of my own. Um, Andrew, probably to you first. The, the Hay Shire Council example, where they're really stepping up for their region, and also the one that you mentioned that Sabine was going to talk about in the Wimmera, where the Progress Association is getting together and getting all the developers to come in and interview them. Um, they sound like great opportunities for partnerships. And I just wanted to get your view on how, as big industry, we actually can work with the local leadership and how we harness that because it's sometimes very hard to know who they are. I mean, we, do, we all do our stakeholder mapping and that sort of thing, but how do you actually um, bring that together? Have you seen the way that Hay has done it? Or can you just give us a bit more of an, uh, information about how that works? Yeah, I, I think the critical part is the community engagement um, sort of component of it, and it's it's... Uh, it's making sure that the community feels that ownership over it. So um, one, one example I didn't mention is I think there was an attempt to replicate something like that Sapphire, um, Sapphire example with another large-scale wind project. And they didn't do the sort of work that CWP did on Sapphire, which was going around and, and essentially they're asking the community to step up and be a partner. And, and if, it, if it's an industry-led thing, it's, um, you know, community's not going to really feel like, oh, my friends are doing this. So, you know, it was, someone was talking about the social marketing part yesterday in the projects. Like, that, that's critical. Like, you've got to, as a community, you've got to feel like this is our thing. It's not their thing, the company's thing. Um, but, and so I, I would say, actually, in that instance, that the role, the best role that a company can do is to create that forum where, where community leaders can step up, equip them with the information, with the tools, be responsive in terms of answering their questions and delivering on the sort of things that they want on it. You know, if it's an investment vehicle you're talking about, um, then, you know, how are you going to facilitate the aspirations of the community in there? So, and it's a... If you think of, for the people who know the um, IAP2 spectrum, uh, which, you know, starts at consultation and then involvement and talks about how industry can, can engage with communities, it really has to be in that collaboration 
zone where you're really working quite intensively with the community. Can I chime in on that too, please, Kat? <laughs> you may. <laughs> and I think speaking, um, speaking to your point about, well, you know, what can big renewables do? And I, like the question behind that question for me is some regions like Hay or in the Wimmera Southern, Southern Marley um, might already have leadership you know, it takes a, a regional champion or a pair of regional champions or, you know, half a dozen of them to be able to pull a collaboration together. But I think there's something, there's a role for industry when they're doing their engagement with regional leaders, individuals, where there hasn't had a collaboration form, is to really seed it and be like, just want to let you know we're really open to collaboration. If you're having an industry table, we would love to be there. And being able to, you know, uh, foster an environment where that regional collaboration can happen, even if it um, might not be led by a single developer, which probably is not necessarily the role of any one developer. Yeah. Great. Thank you for your insights. Uh, we do have uh, quite a few questions um, on our Slido. And the first one I might send over to you, Kim, which is um, what are some key metrics or points that show the value of community benefit models to large commercially driven developers and business? Approval times <laughs> is a big one. Um, uh, I think the development of a wind farm takes a very long time and it's a very complex thing. Same for a solar farm. It takes years. Um, and there's many, many steps along the way um, for big business to be able to get from prospecting through to you know, a viable proposal, having financial close and actually building it well. Um, and having a, a supportive and cohesive community surrounding that development. Um, so the metrics are, are typically on the ones that we've seen um, for social analysis of, is to approval times, the cost of the development process, the number of objections, the numbers uh, you know of letters of support. Um, but and we have seen, um, I think on the Sapphire, I have to get this quote right. I think it's on the Sapphire Wind Farm. Um, no, it was Canoa Bridge. Sorry, on Canoa Bridge, um, they Wind Lab did an analysis, and it, they were able to track the costs through to a five dollar per megawatt hour saving uh, on their business model, based on the upfront investment on excellent community engagement. Yep. Fantastic. Uh, next one is. Uh We've seen some examples of community backlash against renewables, e.g. offshore wind in the Illawarra. I'm from the Hunter and I can tell you that we have had quite a lot of that up in Port Stephens as well. Um, how can better community engagement shift these outcomes? And Andrew, you see a lot of community engagement, good and bad. What, what's your view? Uh, uh, well, that's, that's a particular situation, I think, the offshore wind. Um, there are certainly some concerns about from local people about what it might look like and, and what the issues would be. But I think, I think it's possible, possibly likely, that there's also a sort of bit of political kind of in, in that whole discussion. Like it's, it's turned from something that the community particularly owns into something that's, you know, it's got sort of outside, influ outside interests in keeping that, that argument going. So I think the issue is there, uh, look, I don't, I mean, there's not even projects in Port Stephens or, or Illawarra um, because it's so early days. And if you were to put a floating wind turbine, uh, you know, up in Australia, it's, it's like in, on nuclear scale kind of time, timelines. It's, it's so far off in the distance. And yet there's this sort of confected, you know, sort of thing about it. Um, the, here I'm going to give a, a little bit of a plug. Um, um, CPA and ourselves are doing some work lobbying to the federal government at the moment for um, some issues around education, sort of community education. One is, um, is essentially a large-scale um, education campaign on the energy transition that's, that's, that's tailored to different areas. So in those kind of places it would be, well, what is the role of offshore wind? When could we expect to see it? Why is it here? Um, and, and that would be rolled out. There's also a sort of research centre inside CSIRO where we're talking to them about, and, um, and local energy hubs, which are essentially a series of, of um, you know, one-stop shops, if you like, that are around different uh, renewable energy zones that, that can be an outreach centre for, for people 
Uh, it can also do some of the work on the community benefits, you know, and, and letting people know what they can expect. Um, so I actually think in, the, in those kind of cases, proponent community engagement is critical and has to happen in a good way, but it has to happen in, a, in an ecosystem where people are, understand what's going on and feel like they can see themselves in the transition. And Andrew, just to add to that from the industry perspective, we, we also believe it's very important to have um, a, a big conversation and education around renewable energy because that's the piece that seems to be missing, that everything seems to be focused on a project here or a project there and all the developers are doing their community engagement. Um, and we've been talking with the CEC, Clean Energy Council, about their role in doing that. So it's great to hear that that's coming from, your, from the community side as well. So we really do need that education piece because it's the, the industry, I think, has sort of leapfrogged that valuable piece that's missing. So um, it, there's a lot of support from the industry about that as well. The I'm, next... I'm wondering if we could hear some of the questions in the room as well. Rather than just the, I don't know how this is meant to run, but sure, yeah, <laughs> that's um, a great idea. We might do that. So, if, are there any questions we have in in house? Yep. You just let, let us know who you are before yeah, you ask. Jonathan Prendergast, Panel Energy, and um, I know in Goulburn, um, some large-scale projects have been emerging there, 400 megawatts by BP Light Source, and so on. And the case that you can have been controversial with some opponents. Yeah, I think so. But, um, I mean, in a way, the, the two, our project, our little one and a half megawatt one and this other 400 megawatt, you know, large scale one are quite different. For a start, we don't have a, a federal shadow treasurer living next to our thing, so that's kind of pretty good. <laughs> that makes our life a bit easier and their life a bit harder. Um, uh, but, but I think, you know... I, the discussion around solar, in um, it, it can kind of work two ways. Like, people can say, oh, well, yeah, but, like, one and a half megawatts next to the train line, that's all right, we can hack that, that's cool. But going back to my original point, you know, there has to be large-scale stuff and small-scale stuff as well. So, it, you know, we need to kind of avoid the, the idea that we can fix it all with small-scale stuff and then... But use the example... Of, of of the the understanding that's that's grown around that that community project and the support, you know, three those three hundred people are pretty much all within twenty or thirty k of, of Goulburn. Like it's it's really very tightly held. So there's a lot of really deep engagement in Goulburn around solar, and so using that, yeah, I think in that way it absolutely has been helpful. I'd also add to that that. Community energy projects, we know, build social cohesion. We know they build energy literacy in our communities. And those two things are really important for the large-scale energy shift to be able to um, collaborate with, not leverage, <laughs> leverage from. Um, and uh, that's, that's, it's in the nuance of that. We're not asking regional communities to accept the large-scale renewable energy at any cost. It's conditional, and it's conditional on great community engagement. Now, there's, there's layers to that. We can see developers do lots of consultation and not deliver great community engagement. Um, and being able to understand what that looks like and the nuance of every single different community that they're developing in is going to be different. We're all unique um, communities. And so, you know, in one community, you can't get anything, anything up in town unless you are at the football every Friday night. On another community, it's like you must be present on XYZ Facebook page. Um, you, but you need to know, and the only way you know is by being on the ground and having those conversations and developing great relationships. And I think um, understanding the difference between lots of consultation and great community engagement is really important. And now it's time for a plug from CPA, um, which is one of the things that we offer uh, for large-scale industry is a, a fully accredited short course on socially responsible renewable energy wow. development. And it's important for us at CPA able to be able to share those insights about what communities want and hear um, for their engagement needs. Shasta and Yerba Bella. 
I've been following the, uh, the Golden Project since its beginning when they won that grant. Uh, it must be nearing completion. Could you give me an update? Sure. Um, <laughs> that's a, that's Can you repeat the questions for the online? Uh, yes. So, um, uh, so Rob had been following the Golden Solar Project um, since its inception, which was some time ago. What's what's the update on the project? The project at the moment has um, is a beautifully cleared block of land, about one and a half hectares in uh, one and a half hectares, in um, next to the railway line in Goulburn. It has an excellent fence, uh, and, a, and, a, and a and a wonderful. It's a really good fence. <laughs> like it's a great fence. I love that fence, um, uh, and it also has. Uh, an absolute truckload of, of, of very detailed plans and documents. Um, we are, oh, look, you know, I'm looking hard at Jonathan here. I'm surprised you're not feeling the, the vibe. But it's, um, it, like, it's certainly our plan to be building this year and uh, to be generating by the end of this year. We have a construction certificate application in at the moment or at least, well, by the end of the week. Or, like, it's developing a project is quite complicated, it turns out. It sure is. Let's hope there's a big party. <laughs> oh, we'll just go back to the Slido. There might be some people um, online who... I beg your pardon? Yep. Can I come back to you in a second? I'll just get this quick question here. Um, can you talk about the options for structuring community benefit funds? Kim, this might... Or maybe this is relevant to both of you. So we can propose alternatives to developers who come knocking. It's a good question. Okay, look, there's, there's so many different ways that this can be cut. Um, typically, large-scale developers, um, they do... I don't want to group them all in because there's so many developers doing some really innovative, you know, creative stuff. Historically, let's say historically, it's been around a community grants fund. And then uh, communities have kind of advocated for how much governance and participation they've had into that um, administration of that grant fund. That, that Let's say that's historically what's happened. Um, but I think I'd really challenge communities that do have developers are knocking um, in their regions to think a little bit outside that, um, use that as a foundation, a deeply participatory and deliberative process for community grant funds. But then, um, Come, come back to an engagement process that really works with the community to identify what the needs are. Because it might not be cash that that community needs, depending on how many other developments they already host in the region and how many other grant funds are already in operation. It might be more partnerships um, which have greater value than just cash grants. And those partnerships might be access to, to knowledge and opportunity. It might be around um, the number of uh, not just the number of, of learning jobs that a development might offer, for like apprenticeships and, and graduate positions, but partnering with local institutes to, to bring training to a region that might otherwise be a three or four hour drive away. And now that, that is something that industry can leverage that, that is, is more valuable than the dollars of what's involved in that. So um, I suppose to answer the structural question, it's... It's, it's looking at the richness of the tapestry of the parts of community benefit sharing as opposed to just how we structure the grants fund part. Yeah, the, the additional part I'd, I'd put onto that is a bit depends on the state that you're in because the, the, the benefit fund that a project has might be interacting with, if you're in one of the New South Wales renewable energy zones, for instance, there will be a res-wide fund that the state government will be operating. Um, and also, the, the councils will have set up um, what's kind of hilariously called a voluntary planning agreement um, between the proponent and the council. Um, there's nothing voluntary in the voluntary planning agreement. Um, I understand they're <laughs> dropping the name, but that would be kind of nice for accuracy. Um, but that will already have been set up as well, and so hopefully that VPA has, has provisions in it for, you know, delivering stuff to, to community people as well as just the, the upgrading roads and that kind of thing that councils love. Um, it's different in Victoria. Councils are looked after. The, 
proponents have probably got more flexibility in Victoria to give communities things that they want, um, and other states are a bit different too. And just before I come to the next question, um, from the industry perspective, we really like to see community models. If you've got an idea uh, about the model that you'd like, then that would be heaven for us to be able to have a conversation with you about that because sometimes we operate in a little bit of a vacuum where we have some ideas and we test them and communities less than excited about it and um, so if it's really coming from you and it's feasible I think that um, most developers particularly us at Quadrant Energy would be really happy to have those conversations um, and I should just also add that um, we can't forget the First Nations benefits that can come out of some of this out at Yungala in New Wellington we've got a large First Nations community out there and we work really closely we've got a first, two First Nations um, uh, I've got a head of First Nations engagement and a, and a First Nations engagement facilitator uh, working with us and we're about to hire another facilitator so that we can really get into the communities, the First Nations communities and find out what it is they really need and want because um, it's got to come from you, it's got to come from your communities and from in Indigenous <coughs> communities in order to really work because it doesn't really work or provide benefit if it's not wanted. I'll go to the lady at the back who wanted a question earlier. Just to for the people online, um, at the convention centre here today, there's a big conference downstairs, uh, Energy Smart Conference, and a lot of developers there. And the question was really about we're all sitting up here. Um, what are our ideas for bringing industry and people like us together? Or you? I, I suppose I'm big industry. People like you. Too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's us and us. You know, I said it at the beginning. It's not us and them. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's that's exactly. It's us and us. It's, uh, um, uh, I, th I think the my, my sense is that those companies, including the ones sort of downstairs, um, it's working with with people like Kath actually, who are who are that part of the company. So what's I, what's remind me your your title? Um, yeah. yeah, I'm the head of community and stakeholder engagement. Yeah. Week. So there, there's you know the companies are really bolstering that that part of their business now because they understand that you can't just engage with a you know engineer who's got a bit of time on their hands you know it has to be much more detailed it has to be thoroughgoing and it has to be comprehensive um, and I think finding the right people in those companies can often be the challenge but once you find them that's their they're the, the pathway into having those discussions and making the bridges between the community and the companies I, I really couldn't agree more. I am curious because it might be a complete no show of hands, but other than Squadron Energy, are there any big renewables in the room at the moment? Welcome. It's lovely to have you here. And also, uh, not a developer, but like shout outs to Josh, if you put your hand up here, he's from Essential Energy, um, also from the community engagement team. So, you know, events like this um, are, are important, um, but then uh, I suppose wherever you can find a contact point into big renewables individually and then seeking out um, the innovation teams and the community engagement teams. Now that sounds a bit pie piecemeal, Sally, like, you know, in response to your question, it's like, why is it on us to like, you know, one by one go to developers to, to you know, to, to make this shift? But I think that chain, change is motivated quite parochially, I think, at times. And so to create leverage and buy-in for the types of community action that we need, it almost needs to be geographic because that, that is where we get our leverage points on a project-by-project -project basis. Um, the likes um, of CPA and REA, we are behind the scenes advocating our lights out on this topic. <laughs> um, to industry and to government, um, but there's all, you know we always need more support, more voices, more letters coming from from the sector as well. I think we need to wrap it up. Is that right? Yes. Eleven o'clock. Yeah. Um, we've got more questions online. I'm sure there's more questions. There's one question. We might ask the other big developer in the room for his question. No, and we might, uh, we, can we have a couple of extra minutes, Heather? Um, so for those online, the question is around land use planning. It's probably one I'll need to tackle. Um, and um, sterilising um, good arable land. I guess the first thing to say would be that uh, we, we have two ways of, try of, of obtaining land and of course when you're a developer the first question you always have about a project is land, land, land. You know, you've got to get the land, you've got to sign it up 
Uh, you've got to get an agreement with the host, you've got to get an agreement with the neighbours, etc. So you, you are always looking for land that has good wind or solar potential. And, uh, and then you go knocking on doors. That's basically the process. And it's a hard job for some of our developers, just fronting up to people, but that's where we start. But increasingly what we're finding is people coming to us. So would, a day would not go by that we don't get an email from someone who fills in our um, you know, land form that we have on our website and wants us to come and uh, develop on, on their land. So it, it is about permission in that individual sense, but I get the point also it's about, on a regional level, what if the farmers who have got great arable land are all going to put it under uh, renewable energy? Um, what does that do for food and fibre production uh, or similar? And uh, I know that, that uh, DPI in New South Wales has a, you know, has a soil and um, rating system. I'm not an expert in this field, but... Um, so that, that comes into play as well. But one of the things about wind, of course, is that most of it's on grazing land. So you can still graze and, and we don't, there's, no, there's not really any conflict. Solar is probably slightly different. We don't do a lot of solar, but um, we do some. And, but we've seen studies where um, sheep have done better, where there's been a solar farm because they get that moisture off the panels. It creates more green pick. They, the, the sheep that are, are in those paddocks um, are doing doing well. So, but in your area, it's probably more. Um, I don't know. Is it vegetables and it's really rich soil and you know, that sort of thing? Um, it, it is. It is problematic, and I think that's where developers and local government and regional farmers federations, etc., need to work together to identify whether or not they really are the best locations or not to put something. Um, yeah, but it's probably more of a regulatory question to be answered than maybe from someone like us. Yeah, I'd also add to that, um, you know, and this isn't this isn't a panacea or a golden bullet, um, but we've seen some really exciting um, technology advancements in Japan and Germany with the combination of um, horticulture and solar, particularly, um, and uh, you know, for example very high solar panel racking where tractors can actually pass underneath it, um, providing some shade for quite fragile crops uh, like, like blueberries or grapes and those, those sorts of um, horticultural crops. And I think that that's pretty cutting edge for Australia. When we do solar farms and wind farms, we, th we think about the most tightly, most efficiently packed type of technology. Um, but I think there is a space for communities to... Um, to be advocating research trials and, and innovation. And, um, you know, in Western... In, in that area west of Brisbane, there's, a, you know, a wonderfully rich um, agricultural research sector, which I think would be... You know, there would be some really, really cool programs in that space around um, some leading-edge agrivoltaic-type installations um, just to be able to, you know, broaden the way we do things in Australia when there's precedent overseas of it, you know, coexisting. We might have one final question. I think there was one up the back that I saw. Thanks. And that was, ju that was just an endorsement for the training program that Kim's, the Community Power Agency is running, for those of you online. And you might just reiterate a little bit about that. Sure. So the course um, for those online was, it's the Socially Responsible Renewable Energy Development short course. We call it SRED. Um, we deliver it in partnership with Griffith University, so it's, um, it's fully accredited and it, it, it um, enables uh, big renewables to be able to meet some of their professional development um, points that they need to do for um, maintaining their accreditation. And it really focuses on um, helping to you know, local government, transmission line developers, generation and storage developers and community members who are wanting to upskill and understand what best practice and better practice can look like come together and, and understand social impact assessments, social feasibility studies, great, great community engagement, great benefit sharing and, um, and local procurement and First Nations engagement and, and bringing that all together in a way that's highly practical. It's not just motherhood statements. It's actually what it looks like, how it can be done on the ground and some examples. Yeah. And yeah, we are running another course this year. We're um, just uh, updating it, and um, hopefully mid mid next mid this year we'll be running a next intake. Great, thanks, Kim, and uh, 
I'd just like you to um, put, put your hands together for Kim and obviously Andrew, who's not here. <laughs> <laughs>